Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening to this wonderful little presentation called My Colors Are Mine, New Shades of Detective Fiction in Catching Teller Crow, which was originally presented at GIFCON in 2023 in May. I'm sure everyone knows a great detective such as Sherlock Holmes. All detective stories seem to follow a similar pattern. Crime, investigation and finally a restoration of order through the detective's master narrative. Take, for example, Arthur Conan Doyle's A Study in Scarlet. We start with the murders of Enoch Drebber and Joseph Stangerson, follow with the investigation conducted by Sherlock Holmes and his partner Watson, and conclude with the arrest of cabby driver Jefferson Hope, who killed the two men for revenge. The narrative uncovers the motive and eventually the order which was disrupted by the crimes is restored. Todorov famously claimed, detective fiction has its norms. To develop them is also to disappoint them. To improve upon detective fiction is to write literature, not detective fiction. Before I can tell you why I personally take issue with that claim, it is necessary to highlight the very norms Todorov is referring to. Let us take a look at the genre's conventions first laid out by Van Dyne's 20 rules for writing detective stories, which indicate how the great detective is supposed to arrive at a solution. As we don't have time to discuss all of them in detail, I will point your attention to three in particular. First, the methods of detection have to exclude imaginative and speculative devices. The problem of the crime must be solved by strictly naturalistic means. Second, the method of murder and the means of detecting it must be rational and scientific. And third, there can only be one detective, one protagonist, one deus ex machina, and the detective, who is most commonly male, cannot be implicated in the crime. Van Dyne's rules may have functioned as a foundation for countless of the traditional detective narratives Todorov references, yet it is crucial to put them in perspective and investigate the historical background of the genre. Caroline Wrights argues that the detective genre emerged from debates about English civilization in the 17th century. The police or the investigators posed an organized force who was supposed to deal with domestic disruption and establish power in English colonies. Consequently, the figure of a great detective like Sherlock Holmes is still influenced by the historical background. The character stems from empiricism and served as a representative of the British Empire, which was regarded as superior. Methods of detection included rationality and imperial sciences in order to fight the culprits, or often an alienated other. Since the detective is supposed to re-establish the dominant social order, the law itself is rarely questioned within the story. The methods of early detective fiction became a tool to justify colonial control and propagated English values, which is why the use of imperial epistemologies in modern de detective narratives has to be regarded critically. To this day, traditional detective narratives often try to maintain the established order and Eurocentric viewpoint of the British Empire. Even though Van Dyne's rules may have laid out a foundation for the genre that highlights the importance of genre continuity, his rules can and should be contested and broken. As Lucas Matala and Tina Borger highlight, detective fiction, so consumed with maintaining civility and non-criminality, is a perfect site for post-colonial critique of the very institutions and authorities that are normally upheld by the genre. Contrary to Todorov's claim, I will argue that challenging the norms of vastly imperialistic narrative patterns greatly improves the genre that thrived on racial othering. Such post-colonial critique is offered by the magical realist young adult novel Catching Teller Crow, a narrative that actively contests imperial epistemologies of the Eurocentric genre. Written by Aboriginal Australian storytellers Amberlynn and Ezekiel Quaimalina, the quote-unquote exotic cultures are no inspiration for horror or frame them as culprits. The novel focuses the investigation on a fire in a children's home and then the discovery of a corpse inside the burnt building. At the centre of the plot are three dead Aboriginal girls, eponymous Isabel Catching, Beth Teller and Crow. The narrative is seemingly divided into two strands the central narrative perspective, which follows the ghost of Beth and is written in prose form, and the poetic form recounting the story of catching. As Mettel and Borger point out, however, taken together, the narratives produce a third narrative, which revolves around Crow, the first victim of the novel's perpetrators. Together, they uncover organized child abuse hidden away by the police and the ongoing abuse of power local authorities can wield over female Aboriginal lives.
Furthermore, the novel addresses Australia's co colonial history and the genocide against indigenous peoples. Instead of following Van Dyne's rules, Catching Telecro dismantles the conservative genre tra tradition and rewrites the detective story. First, let me revert your attention back to Van Dyne's rules and the need for one protagonist, one deus ex machina. In Catching Telecro, there is not one detective, but two, and neither of them is a great detective like Sherlock. Beth and her father Michael, or Detective Teller, are both the primary investigators and they are only able to solve the crime by working together. While the traditional detective story, like the aforementioned Sherlock Holmes example, can certainly have two investigators, they are not operating on an equal level. There is one great detective and there is an assistant. One is superior to the police force and one is not. However, in the case of Catching Telecro, without Beth's ghostly presence and her father Michael's ability to see her, the investigation central to the novel would likely never progress. They both assist each other, assessing important evidence together, and deduct the consequences. Since Beth is no longer a living, breathing girl, her and her father present two joint sites, a detective narrative grounded in realism and the influence of the fantastic, the magical realism. This is best demonstrated by the engagement with Isabel Catching. Detective Teller first calls Catching's believability as a witness into question, trying to justify her fantastical story of monsters with an alleged drug abuse. Further, he argues that when your life gets upended, like when you're admitted to rehab, say, it can feel like you've been thrown into a strange place. Beth, however, the magical realist part of the duo, notes monsters and other places, other dimensions. It was all so unbelievable, yet what Catching had said felt true. And after all, I was living proof that there was more to this world than what most people saw. Later, it is Michael who comes to the conclusion that Catching has been dead the entire time. As Beth argues that Catching's death is impossible since she's the witness, he points out that Catching has simply been mistaken for the witness and that she died the night of the fire. In the very end, Michael believes to have solved the case, but it is his ghostly daughter Beth who points out that he missed all the clues. She has to take over the traditional role of the detective by explaining at least some of the clues that led to her reconstruction of the crime story. As Madeleine Borga emphasized, the entire plot were to fall apart if not for the combination of both elements. This leads me to the other two of Van Dyne's rules catching Telecro defies. The most obvious subversions are the characters themselves. I've already mentioned the big part magical realism plays. One part of the detective duo is the ghost of a dead girl, as is the witness of the investigation. And yet, the ghostly presence is not the only part of the novel operating within the magical realist mode. Despite the novel's premise with the murder investigation, the real mystery of the narrative resides with the character of Isabel Catching. The witness communicates her experiences to the investigators in heavily metaphoric, magical realist poetry that slowly unveils the crimes committed against her. She was abducted and taken to a bunker, a place where the earth opens like a mouth, where her and the other captives are swallowed. The abductors are beings she calls fetches, creatures with leathery grey wings clad in robes, their faces covered by white masks with human features. Catching immediately deducts that they can't be human. Yet, the fetches only serve the two feats, more terrifying monsters which are described as large, white and thin. One of them is identified by Beth as one of the crime's perpetrators by his mirror eyes. Beth fur further observes that Catching's story and her own experiences in this town suddenly slam together. As the two narrative forms are merged, so are the elements of magical realism and detective fiction. This, of course, also extends to the method of murder, which was committed by the first victim, Sarah Blue. Initially, she is presented as powerless and adheres to the canon of detective fiction that victimizes women. She has no claws or wings to bite and cannot think of a way to escape from the bunker. However, upon closer inspection, Sarah or Crow is far from the traditional victim. She is the perpetrator of the crimes committed against her abusers. Writing within the detective tradition, the clues that point towards Crow are scattered throughout the text according to the generic requirements. To name a few examples, Crows are present through, throughout all the investigation, sitting close to the children's home, and as Beth points out, Crow had been there all along. 
Yet, as Metala and Boga emphasize, a spectral crow is far from a stereotypical suspect in the traditional detective story. While she is too a dead girl, she is described as more than a creature than a girl. Grey skin, grey hair that trails to the floor, grey dress made from her hair. Even more importantly, her beak as the murder weapon further defies Van Dyne's rules, as it is indeed a speculative one. There is no rational explanation for it. It is described as an unusual weapon, some kind of blade with a slight curve to it. Yet by the end, the revelation of the murderer does not lead to a re-establishment of order. So here comes the big question. So what? So why does the novel reject the most traditional norms of detective fiction? Reason for that lies in the novel's engagement with Australia's colonial history and the violence enacted against Aboriginal peoples. As the Quimalinas are both Aboriginal authors, their novel defies imperial epistemology so ingrained in the original detective story. Especially Isabel Catching's character is connected to both past and present social violence, as the novel ties the ghostly returns of the girls to the lasting uh, after-effects of Australia's stolen generations. The term refers to a policy which originated in the 19th century and forcefully separated Aboriginal children from their families. Placed in either white foster families or mission stations, the intention was to breed out the collar of half-castes to civilise them. Um, referencing the Australian Human Rights Commission, Amberlin and Ezekiel Quaimalina write that no family escaped the effects of forcible removal. In Catching Telacro, Catching exemplifies the multi-generational impact of this policy. Her ancestors, Granny Trudy, Nana Sadie and Grandma Leslie, were removed from their families as children and endured horrible conditions simply because they were Aboriginal. The legal abduction of Catching's ancestors par parallels her own imprisonment at the children's home, where she and other victims are held. Instead of aiding kids who'd been in trouble, children of predominantly Aboriginal descent are systematically abducted and sexually abused, since their disappearances are easier to cover up. If a white girl had gone missing like that, there'd been an outcry. It would have been on the news, in the papers, some, uh, something everyone talked about in the street. People didn't care enough. No one was paying attention. In a direct parallel to a government that never gave anyone back, the two sorters catching Colt's feet seem insatiable, which is substantiated by their repeated chant, one more for the feet, dead girl, dead girl, one more in need. Like her ancestors who had all their choices taken away, catching is stripped of her agency and carried like a piece of meat before having to endure repeated sexual violence conveyed through heavily metaphoric poetry. His palm presses against my stomach, his fingers rip my flesh, he digs for my soul. It's harder for him to find colours. He has taken so many, he has to go deeper. The disappearance of colours catching mentions are a consequence of the traumatic experiences she has to endure. To overpower the feats and regain the colours taken from her, Catching calls on the seemingly lost voices of her ancestors taken by colonial practices. Connections light up across time and space. Granny Trudy Catching, Nana Sadie Catching, Grandma Leslie Catching, Mum, me. As all the strength of the Catching women flow down the family line, the recitation of their names can be read as a refrain, a counterchant to the feat's menacing song and a summoning of the catching women's inter- and intragenerational strength, opposing the male and post dominance prevalent in the detective genre. Catching then starts to name the greys clouding her colours in order to overcome her trauma, despair, sadness, fear and shame. Finally, she says to the feats, this grey's yours, my colours are mine. I'm not carrying your shame for what you did, only my pride for surviving you. This use of women's relationships and the tie to magical realism emphasizes the strength that can be derived from personal family histories. The focus does not lie with their removal of agency at the hands of colonialism, but the fortitude and force of the family despite of it. Amberlin Quaimalina further emphasizes the importance of Aboriginal defiance. Indigenous people lived through the end of the world, but we did not end. Catching's magical realist testimony then equally defies the boundaries of death and life and gently guides the investigators towards the truth. 
The true crime of the novel is the abuse of Aboriginal girls throughout the fraught history of Australia since its colonisation, and therefore order should not and cannot be re-established by the detectives. Since revenge has already been served, Catching's return reminds of historical, but more importantly, presently continuing crimes against Aboriginal peoples in a seemingly post-colonial Australia. At the end of the novel, as the bodies of both the abducted girls are found and the truth is uncovered, Detective Teller reveals his guilt and speaks out about the problem of the detective who always arrives too late to prevent society from falling into disorder. He says, we didn't get here at the beginning, we got here when it was all over, we got here at the end. However, Catching responds, of course you're here at the end, so what? It's the beginning that hasn't happened yet. Catching Telecro offers a final resolution that is not only a powerful rejection of the traditional detective narrative, but also offers the possibility for resolution beyond merely reacting to the crime. The magical realist voice of Catching gestures to the possibility for change, not an expectation to rewrite the past or fill criminal absences with explanations or master narratives. As Michael admits that the victims were failed by the police and justifies gross murders, ultimately covering up for her and presenting the police with a false narrative, um, he offers reconciliation between victims and law enforcement. The final resolution and real closure is however rooted in the Aboriginal Australian worldview outside of Western-centric temporalities. The ghosts of Beth, Catching and Crow may move on from their trauma and their deaths to another existence, but neither their presences nor their memory are fully gone. The Kwaimalinas say that Aboriginal stories also tell of a non-linear world, one in which time does not run in a line from the past through the present and on into the future. All life is in constant motion, turning and rotating in relation to other life, and it is through these movements that the world shifts forward or back. Catching can now walk all sides of the world, indicating that death is not the end. For the girls, it is merely a different facet of existence that has been achieved. After Catching and the other two ghosts put new processes of justice into motion, the girls turn towards the future. Consequently, the inherent colonial order still prevailing in Australia's treatment of Aboriginal peoples and inherent to the traditional detective narrative is refigured. Catching Telecro is a detective novel that is transformed into an optimistic site of resistance, even renovation, against hegemonic power. The coexistence of the supernatural and the real in the novel rejects uh, rational European realism and acknowledges an alternative Aboriginal reality. Finally, it is necessary to mention that, just as Catching's presence is not gone from the world, the impact and continued legacy of the stolen generations remains. As David Kahn points out, the deep roots of systematic abuses of power targeting Aboriginal children remain yet to be unearthed, and a reconciliation of the past, a potential beginning of a decolonized future, has yet to happen. The closure of one particular story, the narrative suggests, is just the beginning of a much bigger project of healing and acknowledging the many other stories that are still hidden from view. And so to come to a conclusion, disconnecting the traditional detective story from Eurocentric notions of justice and order in the novel allows for the true Australian uncanny horror to emerge. The repetition or rather continuation of history, the disregard for Aboriginal lives and systematic violence rooted in colonial practices. In contrast to conventional Western-centric detective stories, the relation to Australia's colonial history and its practices draws attention to past and present injustices and imbalanced power dynamics in Australia. Divorcing the genre tradition from its imperialistic origins permits Aboriginal writers like Anne Boleyn and Ezekiel Kwaimolina to address the impact of colonization and allows for Aboriginal voices to be heard in the future. Thank you so much for your attention.